as I'm a Nobel Prize winner. I know everything. <laughs> uh, uh, no, well before, I, everybody knew I knew nothing, but the next day after that, everybody assumed that they could ask me any question on any planet in the universe. Anyway, uh, if anybody wants to ask me a question, I'm happy to try to uh, respond in any way I wish, but I hope you don't get angry with me. Okay, anybody? Nobody wants to know. Oh, I can go. <laughs> yeah. Should I pick on somebody? It's like you. Um, <laughs> I guess I feel like I see this asked. I feel like I see this question asked a lot, but if you were to give advice to yourself as a, a graduate student about starting a career in, in uh, the sciences, uh, what sort of advice would you give yourself? Well, <laughs> the one I gave myself was when I was at university, was to take advantage of everything that was going on there. I think the talk about uh, internet education for people who don't go to university. Well, that's fantastic if they can't go. But I never thought of university as just the course. So I was there, I played tennis for the university. We got to the finals of the UAU. Um, they lost because of me. Um, well, I, I didn't have that killer instinct, you know. Uh, one out of every 10 athletes is good because they play well under pressure. And I knew I didn't do that. So I never put myself under pressure. That's another bit of advice. So if I had a, a project, I um, would get, make sure it was finished a day or two early. I never left it to the last minute. And then maybe a bit of tidying up at the end. So because I always felt that there were, I was not the sort of person who could respond and do well under pressure. And nine out of 10 people are like me. One out of 10 are like John McEnroe, and they play well under pressure. And they're the champions. But sport is not what life's about. Life's not about competition as far as I'm concerned. I don't like competition. Um, I don't put myself into these things. So when I was at university, I decided to take advantage of all the extra mural things that were going on there. And uh, so I became art editor for the student magazine. I did the covers. I used to paint murals and uh, I painted a, a theatre set. I thought uh, I'd like to do something with the Students' Union, and I became president of the Athletics Council, a bit of politics. I decided I never want to be a politician. Um, they say someone has to do it, but I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that anyone should be a politician. Anyway, I knew I didn't want to do that. And then, uh, well, while I was there, it was, it was the 60s, of course, and uh, if you couldn't play a musical instrument, uh, or guitar or something, no one would take it. You wouldn't go to any parties. So in those days, you had to go there and and do something, you know, play a couple of gigs or, or jigs or whatever you call them nowadays. And then uh, you wouldn't meet any girls. Of course, I met my wife at university as well. But the main thing, I would say, is not to do anything second rate. If second rate effort satisfies you, do something else. Find something 
else that only your first, your best effort would satisfy you. You are not doing those projects, those assignments for a teacher. They're doing it because they think, maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, that this is in your best interest. And therefore, to do it second rate is a waste of your time. You've got to put your back into it. And if you find you're in a subject where you can't do that, then I think you should look around for something else where only your best effort will satisfy you personally. You understand? And uh, so that, um, and then I, I met a guy who got a first class honours degree. And I thought, oh, he must be a genius. Well, so I asked him how he did it. Well, he said, I, I made a very good set of notes from my lectures. And then every evening, I um, went through them and underlined uh, the main topics. Now, that, not every line. And then I made a list of those headings of the topics in there. Now, that may seem passive, but it's not. It's you're looking at those notes and you're analyzing them for what is the salient information in that section. And then he had, so I did that. And I got one too. So I thought, I must be a genius as well. Um, so those are some of the bits of advice. Don't look at university as just some place to get a degree. It's a place where you're graduating in the best possible environment from school where you are told what to do to the outside world where you will be on your own and you will have to make decisions of your own. And those who can't go to university and think that they're going to get something on the internet, they're not going to get those other very important uh, aspects of life that among your peers, people who are about your own age, um, get from us. It's not there. For me, university was more than 50% something else other than my, my degree. Uh, is that useful? Yeah, thank you. Um, I feel like we talk a lot when we give presentations about the successes and the stuff we've done, but um, could you comment on if there was ever like the setbacks you had in your career or if there was ever a time in your career where you thought that you weren't going anywhere or the outlook looked pretty dim and how you overcame those times? What was that, Molly? Is there any time when you're, you had setbacks in your career and you felt you weren't really going anywhere and how you overcame it? Well, it wasn't setbacks? coping. Any setbacks you have? Hey. Setbacks. Oh, setbacks. Well, <clears throat> I never had many setbacks because I never attempted anything big. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I, I knew I, when I was playing tennis I wasn't going to flip win Wimbledon. Um, there were setbacks when I was, um, Experiments that didn't work. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm thinking of more major things about things that bothered me and may have uh, made me lose confidence in myself. Um, I didn't have any big aspirations. I thought I could get a, a reason, reasonable degree. I didn't set out to become a professor or a big Nobel Prize winner. I just thought I would do little things that interested me. So I never felt I was 
tackling a big problem. Um, I, when I went to university, I had no idea what I wanted to do, other than I was quite good at chemistry, and I had a good chemistry teacher who recommended that I go to Sheffield, which is a very good chemistry department. I had a, a, another teacher who uh, gave me extra tuition in, in art, who thought I you know, could do this. And so when I got to university, I, I didn't think I was going to get a first class honors degree. I thought that was impossible. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't top of the form. Um, I was close to the top, but I never felt that I was not capable of doing something useful. So when I got to university, I uh, did my chemistry as well as I could. I did all, everything as well as I could. Um, that was important, I now realize. And then um, when I got my first degree, I decided I was having such a good time and I had a girlfriend <laughs> who was going to be still there. And so I thought, I'd like to continue. And uh, I got uh, interested in quantum mechanics and spectroscopy and did a PhD at the same university uh, in spectroscopy. And uh, everyone it was small things. Yeah, most of the experiments don't work. Uh, three out of four don't work. You have to have a bit of resilience to keep going and talk to people, keep the confidence going. And then I was offered a postdoc in Canada and uh, we decided we're going to go live in another country. That was more important than the postdoc, to go and live somewhere else, not assume you knew anything about other country. So we went to Canada for two years. Then. Uh, I thought well, I'd like to go to the States for a bit. So we came to, I went to Bell Labs. Right, but there, <coughs> I didn't apply to a, uh, an advertisement. What I did was I wrote a proposal to a particular person, but I did work on that group and, and suggested a particular um, sort of experiment and technology that, well now I look back, it's CCD technology, which didn't exist at that time. Anyway, I got the, there and then I was offered a, a postdoc back in the UK so I said, well, we'll try it. And uh, it was a way to get back, not just to go back to university. <coughs> and then, after about six months, I was offered a job, tenure. Oh, I might as well take it. I can always, if it doesn't work, I didn't know whether it was going to be any good at my own research. And when I was there, I didn't have any equipment, nothing. No, I got 5,000 pounds from the department for the year for supply of uh, chemicals. I was given a research student, um, and then I used the equipment that was in the department, and I work with other people with whom I thought I could do some collaborative research. I didn't have any equipment of my own. I used what was there. I was able to do that. I didn't go and get a million dollars from a startup as a, a, an assistant professor and then have 
three years burden around my neck because I was tenured, but I didn't go that way. I used the equipment I, could, I was there, and I got results coming in within months. I didn't have to build anything. It was already there. I was sufficiently flexible to use the equipment that was there. And then, <clears throat> as time went on, I, um, I found the most useful thing is something I mentioned yesterday, to work with undergraduates, smart kids like you, or were, are. And just, uh, oh, I don't know whether this will work. Let's try it. And you, you inject uh, ideas into the, into the whole scheme. So, basically, I never looked upon anything as being, uh, they were all small things. Published something. I thought, well, I can publish. I never set out to publish big, world-shattering papers. I just set out to publish things that interest me personally and that I could collaborate. And in fact, <coughs> if I wanted to uh, do important things, I would never, ever have done the experiment that led to the Nobel Prize. It was probably the least important experiment I ever did prior to doing it. You can never tell what surprises are in store. So don't set up big things. This is a big thing. Well, some people do. And some people, some people win the gold medal at the Olympic Games. Uh, they don't get there without a lot of focus effort. Some people win the Nobel Prize and they may focus on a big problem. But I didn't do that. I focused on a very, very little problem that was interesting to me personally. And in that case, I had no competition because nobody was interested in this thing. And neither was Rick Smalley. It took him a year and a half to agree. Bob Curl was saying, look, we should do this. Bob was my friend. I didn't know Rick at all. And they finally we agreed to do it. So if you're going to win Wimbledon, you know we've got Djokovic ahead of you. If you want to be successful in science, just do your own thing. And I think that's the advice I would give whatever you do. And I thought, well, <clears throat> if I'm not good at uh, research, after five or six years, I'll moonlight and I'll do my graphics over the weekend and try to gradually shift that way. And in some ways, the difference between art and science is very small, except for one thing. And that is, the universe is in control in science. And you are in control in art. What you will like goes. If you, whatever you want doesn't matter. The universe is the way it is, whether you like it or not. And uh, quite often, you don't like it. <laughs> is that okay? <coughs> I just have a small question. I think, uh, you might have like come across this question. After gaining the Nobel, have you ever felt that uh, you were a not able to dedicate the equal amount of the time that you were able to do it before? Uh, well, Did you find that after you got the Nobel Prize, you had less time? Oh, I never thought of it that way. Uh, for me, I was always giving a lot of lectures before. Now I was giving more. And I was talking to young people like you. And I felt that the Nobel Prize was, was more important for that, that you would listen to me 
about things that I thought was important. And uh, I just felt it was part of the job of getting the prize. Um, it's not what you think it is. Prizes aren't what you think they are. If you've ever won something, when you win it, it becomes unimportant. Uh, um, a student, very interesting, said something to me a long, long time ago, a young female undergraduate. We have award, or we have um, great called O levels, national ones, uh, at about 15. And uh, you, you go in for these, you get half a dozen or so. O level, physics, chemistry, maths, whatever. And she said something, prizes are like O levels. They're not worth anything unless you haven't got them. Very interesting. It's a paradoxical, but it sums up the prize. Once you've got it, you don't think about it. When you think you're going to get it, you think about it. I never thought about getting a prize for science until after I'd done something. I was so surprised that my research was as good as it turned out to be. It turns out it's not about being smart. You have to be good. But you don't have to be the smartest guy on the block. You have to be lucky. You have to do things. In my case, my own thing. I didn't go and do the thing that everybody else wanted to do. People asked me, what's the next big thing? I have no idea. I don't care. I only care about what I want to do. So when the prize, when we got the buckyball, then, of course, people say, you know, this is a big one. This could end up with the Nobel Prize. I thought, hmm, maybe. Um, and uh, so we were, I mean, it was 1985, 11 years. So after about five years, it was f proven to be correct. And after that, we thought, well, it may happen. I think we knew it was on the cards. How high the cards were stacked, I don't know. But it was obviously 100%. And then got the prize. And then, of course, I was always giving a lot of lectures because I used to be quite good at it, much better than I am now. Uh, they're all on the web, so you can see all this stuff somewhere. And uh, <clears throat> but I thought of it more as being a representative of not just science and scientists, but the people who valued truth above everything else. And I felt that was something that within my talks, I always try to talk about. Not just about what I did, not just about the science, but about very deep, important things, like the Enlightenment. America was created by enlightened people. Jefferson, Madison, um, Benjamin Franklin, and uh, Thomas Paine. People who had seen the ravages that religious wars had done in the, in the 17th century, the 1600s, the Thirty Years' War was terrible in Europe between Catholics, Lutherans, and Calvinists. And people, ordinary people, were living as wars were sweeping through. And you were very lucky in America to have these really brilliant people who recognized something very important, and that for democracy, you need the separation 
of church and state. You cannot have democracy in the, if there is a dogma controlling the politics. And you do have dogma, left and right, but they keep changing. So you don't have them all the time, theoretically. And this is one of the most important things that America has for democracy. You read through Jefferson's writings and you realize that uh, you can't do that. And the memorial and the monsters of the state of Virginia on religious education stipulates that there should be no religious teaching in schools. You can go to the church and get it. You can go to your mosque or whatever and get it. But you should go to the school to learn what I think is most important, deep down, natural philosophy, to decide what you're being told is actually true. So you can ask a politician, what evidence do you have for saying there's no global warming? To a scientist, what evidence do you have to say there's global warming? Those are the most important things that you can ask these questions. And then I started with Kant to say for an enlightened environment, you have to be able free to criticize the government, the people who are telling you what to do. That freedom took a long while to get. That freedom, as I pointed out, the Inquisition burned um, Bruno for claiming that the stars were stars like our sun. They threatened Galileo for saying that the earth goes around the sun. You are so lucky to live today. But there's a problem because you can say something uh, and whatever, now you can get shot. It's more dangerous now than it was in the 60s. You're less free. That's where I can say you're not enlightened yet. You're on the way to enlightenment. But you're not there yet because people are frightened of saying what they think. Saudi Arabia, a country with which we trade, was on the lowest section of the freedom of the press. And a young man who blogged and criticized the government, which is of course a religious government, of Sharia law, was handed down a thousand lashes uh, 10 years in jail and $200,000 fine. Well, he only got 50 because there was a world outcry saying this was a savage, inhuman, unenlightened. But they say it's in our law. There's an example of an unenlightened attitude because they go to the Quran and they say, here is Sharia law, this is our religion. And there is where Jefferson recognized. And Madison as well, my favorite president, Madison, recognized that is dangerous. Just as the Inquisition was at law in the 15th century in Europe. We are on the threshold of similar things today. And we are kowtowing to Saudi Arabia on this issue. And they don't understand. Enlightenment is the freedom to criticize, which you have. To criticize your teacher, to criticize your parent, to criticize yourself, the most important person, is criticism of yourself. And so these are things 
that I think are very important for freedom and the sustaining the democratic right that you now have here and that we still have to some extent in Europe. We have more freedom, a separation of church and state in the UK where it's actually in the constitution or whatever than you have here by fear rather than by regulation. For instance, they say <coughs> the people you trust least in the USA are atheists. Well, I have a, have a, there's a problem there. You've got three pilots, and one is dreaming of going to heaven with Jesus, and another one going to Allah, and another pilot said, wow, this is the only life I've got. I'm going to make sure I, at my entrance of all okay. You should always ensure that your pilot realizes or is an atheist. They're the most trustworthy because they probably want to live as long as they possibly can. A, a joke, but there you go. Do you have some time to do your research? Okay. My conciliary. Okay. <laughs> That's no, but and after the Nobel Prize, you had less, obviously more call on your time. But well, that's true. But then I got quite a number of smart young people coming and thinking I'd be a good person to work for. Little did they know. <laughs> <laughs> but they, I got a lot of smart people to come, and they worked for me. And you worked and very long hours, you have to say. What? You worked very long hours. Yes, I think to the detriment of my family. I think um, it is a problem. There's no doubt that, isn't it? I was tremendously supportive. But um, um, when you're doing research, it can take a long time. And I wrote a book that really took a lot of time. Every night for three years, every night after dinner, till maybe midnight. It was a good book. Didn't make any money, but it was still a good book. Um, so there was less time to do research. But I also felt that I was diverted from what I wanted to do uh, by the students and the postdocs research students who wanted to work in nanotechnology. I, I wasn't a nanotechnologist, I was a spectroscopist. But I went that way and we did some good stuff. A lot of it because I had some clever young people working with me who were, uh, did some of their own thing. Because I always said, you know, do your own thing. Don't blow yourself up because I don't want to go to prison. But do your own thing. And if I say it's a crazy experiment, don't take any notice. If I say it's a stupid experiment, take notice because I'm telling you because I think it's just not going to work. For a crazy one, I differentiate. Those are the ones that, well, try it out. The experiments are stupid because you really don't know enough. Um, by that I mean, Go look at the literature and you know that what you're trying to do will kill you. Blow yourself or we've already done that. But crazy experiments are things that uh, theoretically maybe don't look on. Check them out. But make sure you can tell the difference. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, to you, which is more important, curiosity or observation, and why? <laughs> what is more important? 
Well, <clears throat> I think you have to observe something to be curious about it. And uh, I always think that the one thing I had was when I saw something that I didn't understand how it works, I would be curious and look at it. I'm going down the road and I see something, uh, some machine there. So something was going past, where were we last week? We were somewhere else. We were in ne Netherlands, right? Okay, and there were, we were in a car and there was this machine going past. And to this day, I have no idea what it was. But I was looking at it. I was, it was the most crazy looking thing on the back of a truck I'd ever seen. And I still wonder what it was. It, it had a very strange rack on the back. So I, I, I think I'm a visual person and I observe something. For instance, if I see a reflection of the sun on the ceiling in the lecture and I'm, the lecture isn't is a bit boring. <laughs> Have you ever been in one of those? <laughs> I've been so many, including my own. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm looking at this and thinking, there's the sun. Whose watch is it? You know? uh, so the, those sorts of things, just little things that as I go along, I find, find interesting. Little puzzles. I don't do games. I don't play games. I I just I'm Margaret thinks we should have done. Um, I played chess in the chess club at school when I was eleven for a year. I thought this is hard work. I'm going to do work. I'm not going to play a game. I wanted to spend my time. And then if I was going to play a game, we are going to play tennis or football or whatever, cricket. Um, I think you have to have your eyes open and find as much of interest as possible. Now, as an example of the way my crazy mind works, um, I showed you my, a couple of logos. And I do logos. And I think in logos, There's something into more interesting than the logo. And most of them, and now every company has to have a logo. And nine out of 10 are crap. I mean, and they really are bad. And I, was, I was watching them yesterday, on, when they arrived on Tuesday, watching these uh, vans and lorries go along with the most stupid logos. Every uh, one has to have a logo. Now, I, I, what I showed you are good logos. I'm not just saying they, because I did them, but they were a good ones. Because it's an idea. And the idea has to be understandable. You make the observation and then try to link the two together. And it has to be, well, look at the logos in general. I have no idea what's going on there. Um, so, for me, art has to be ideas, uh, science are ideas as well. And I think for great art, there has to be some human spirit behind it. And for good science too, I think you have to do things which I don't focus on defense and things like that. I think if you're going to do science, you should feel you're doing it for humanity. And so observation, you make an observation, you think you got an idea, then if you're curious about your idea, check it out, make sure you look at it from many different points. Um, for me, 
uh, you you go in with an idea of what no, from knowledge before, and you try it, <coughs> and then if it works, check it up from another point of view, meant three or four different ways to make sure you're right. If you got four out of five, I have a rule. Um, if you make an observation and you have an idea, imagination, imagination can run away with you. And uh, check it out. Work out what else might fit. If four out of five fit, you're almost certainly right. If only one out of five fits, you're almost, accent on almost, certainly wrong. And now let's take global warming. You're curious. You make an observation. And what's the observation? Pretty big one. This glacier was here in 1912. And it's three miles back there today. Are other glaciers like that? Not just this one. Nine out of ten are shrinking. CO2. Is that responsible for global warming? We don't know, but it could be. What do you do? Are CO2 temp rising? Hawaiian results going up and up and up. Uh, what's happening? What's happening in the Antarctic and the Arctic? Problems. If you not that, so I don't tell people global warming. Well, I say, look at, at all these pointers and then say, I think we've got a problem. And then you understand why a lot of scientists are worried. They, uh, scientists cannot say we have global warming. What they can say is it's looking more and more like we are, have got global warming and that we have a problem. And uh, <clears throat> my, my view is that we can't be absolutely certain. But that's not science. Science is what is true to a, uh, some de significant degree of reliability. Okay? And in this case, we cannot err on the side we must err uh, on the side of caution. For, you know I mean? We can't just say, I don't care what's going to happen in a hundred years. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose by putting all our efforts into alternative energy resources. Everything to gain. New industries, new ideas, new research, stuff like that. But to continue to take the oil out of the ground and dump it in the atmosphere could be a big problem. And so observation, I think, and then putting things together, and curiosity comes next. Curious, this glacier is back there. What about all the other glaciers? Nine out of ten are receding throughout the world, apparently. Now I'm saying, can I trust those numbers? That's the next thing. How do I know what you're telling me is true? You have to check that too. Is there a vested interest? Is someone, you know, what is the vested interest? That's what you've got to be careful about as well. Your parents want you to do well a university, what's their better to get you off the bat? I don't blame them, okay? You, so these are the sort of things that we teach you, should be taught at a university, not just the scientists, to everyone.